before we enter into that question number 19, we'll, we'll put on the board. Uh, we talked about the brief summary, and I just want to bring us up to date. What He's writing to, to this people of God, and where are they? Are they in Jerusalem or in Babylon? They're in Babylon. They, they have gone into uh, Babylonian captivity. And that, uh, there was a group that went in 597, and there's, of course there's going to be a, uh, a group that's going to be involved with when he comes in 587 and then destruction in 586 and so forth of Jerusalem. But we're going to be seeing something here, and I, I want us to be able to tie this together. For example, in chapter 29, after we've established, and I'll just do, do that, he said, you're, not, you're going to be there for a long period of time. We know it's 70 years. So what do you do? We, we studied this last week. So what are you supposed to be doing while you're in captivity? Yes, settle in. You're going to be there two or three generations, three, and you and you you plant your your gardens, you dwell in your house, you get married and have children, and uh, there's the sense of it's not going to be a two-year stay, it's going it's going to be a, a time factor that I've that I've said seventy years, and then you pray for the people you're <laughs> that's capturing you, you pray for your enemies under Jesus, you pray for those. Doing it, but it's going to benefit you because when you pray for their peace, who enjoys that? You do. You enjoy that. You're going to be there a while. You pray for those people. And I would think that would have an impact upon the people who were indeed uh, over them to see uh, a, a godly people like that. But that's what they were to do. So there, there's the letter being sent. And it's not, it, they're not going to like it. There's some individuals we talk in the latter part of this chapter, they, they don't like that. They've got, they've got their other views, they've got their other prophecies. But I want us to tie something together that, that Jeremiah does this, and this is a great example of this, that we're, we're looking at verse 17. Behold, I will send upon them the sword, the famine, and the pestilence. Those three terms ought to set us, I, I kind of know who he's talking about. And he says, I will make them like what kind of figs? Vile figs. And they cannot be eaten, eaten because what? He didn't say bad. It said they're so bad, didn't it? I mean, <laughs> I, that, that's what I picked out in chapter, where did we hear that before? Chapter 24. They, they came in because they're very bad. You know, I think about little kids being told, you're not just bad, you're very bad. Well, Jeremiah talks like that. And... The point is, it's, so, it's not that you're so inherently sinful or, or you're more sinful. It's that you're so bad, we, I can't eat it. Now, that's, that's, the, that's what's being communicated. That, we can't, you, that you can't partake of that. But he applies that to a certain group. Who is it? Not sinners. We're all sinners. He applies that to a particular group under a particular circumstance in chapter 24. Did you remember that when you read this? Let's establish it again in our, in our minds. Who does that represent? And therefore, who do the good get of figs represent? So let's talk with the bad. No one can give me that? They're the good or the bad? Yes. That's exactly right. And so he, he says that to us. But where do we first learn that? He's bringing this back. And he does this. And if we don't remember it, we ought to say, I remember the very bad figs. <laughs> That's what I said, whoa, I, I, if I hadn't read this book before, I would want to go back there. So let's, let's go back there. And what Joel says, the bad figs are those that are uh, still in Jerusalem. The good figs are those that have already been taken captive. He's, Why? He'll tell us. He told us early. Chapter 24, and in verse 5, Jehovah, God of Israel, he says, Like these good figs, so I'll regard the captives of Judah, whom I've sent out to this place in the land of the Chaldeans for good. What do you mean for good? I'm going to bring them back. They're good. I'm going to bring them back. Not that well, they're sinful, not as sinful as a bad. You know, we think about that. But that's not what he's using this for. He's, he's, he's making a comparison, all right. For I have set my mind, uh, eyes upon them for good, 
and I will bring them again to this land and I will build them and I will pull them down and I will plant them and I will not pluck them up. I will give them a heart to know me. That's what we're picking up. When will you give me a heart? When you've gone through 70 years of discipline. As we just, we saw in this chapter, you're going to be coming to me for prayer. And when that happens, you're wanting to, to turn to me to, to, to come back to Jerusalem. And when you do, I'll, I'll bring you back. He's already said, that's the good figs. They went into captivity. And that's what he's going to be emphasizing in the end of this book. When after Zedekiah is taken into captivity, Gedaliah is put into power and he's assassinated. And the people of, of God around there said, well, we're in trouble. So let's pray, Jeremiah, and find out what should we do. We'll do exactly what God said. God said, stay. Stay. Don't go. And we've got to realize, well, I, I don't want to be a, uh, I don't want to be a bad thing. <laughs> but it, he just making this point here. When, you, when God speaks, you better listen to him at the moment he speaks of what you ought to do. But in this case, he's making that distinction. So we ask, you know, well, he's, he just talked about the, the good figs, so what are the bad ones? Look at verse 8. I'm, I'm in Jeremiah 24. As the bad figs, which cannot be eaten, they are so bad. Surely, thus said Jehovah, so I'll give up Zedekiah the king of Judah and his princes and the residue of Jerusalem that remain in this land, and they shall dwell in the land of Egypt. They'll be tossed to and fro. And notice in, in verse 10, I will send the sword the famine, the pestilence. That's besiegement. That's the army coming in with Chaldea. They'll come in sword and pierce you through. It will cause a besiegement, it will cause a famine, and they'll bring forth sickness in the streets. That won't be happening in Babylon. And you pray for their peace over there. You pray for uh, Babylon's peace so you can have peace. But that's the distinction that he made. Did you pick it up as we come into chapter 29? And we begin to see your, the latter end, at verse 12. You shall pray unto me, and I will hearken unto you. You shall seek me and find me. You shall search for me with all your heart, and I'll be found of you, said Jehovah. I will turn again your captivity. I will gather you all the nations from all the places thither. I have driven you, said Jehovah. I'll bring you again to this place, because I carried you away, away captive. There's hope. There's good in the latter end. Because ye have said Jehovah hath raised us up prophets in Babylon, we're going to find out that we're not going to have to be uh, worried about, about staying here. You know, we're, they're going to all come back anyway on our, on our timetable. No, you're, you're the ones that are going to suffer. The other people have already been taken to captivity. You're the ones staying. You're going to have the sword. You're going to have the famine. You're going to have the pestilence. You're the very bad figs. And it has nothing to do with, with what they're so sinful than the other people. They all have sinned. They, that's why they're going into captivity. But what he's saying is, but dwelling in the time that I'm saying to dwell, that's going to be good for you. A lot of it is discipline. Just a two-year thing over there. So they, they may not have got the message. But 70 years of being apart from their homeland. That's, that's the point that God made. It's kind of a lifetime of, of some of those people. By reason of strength you live 80, but three score and 10. And so I just want to know if, if you picked that up when he's, he begins to talk about the good that's going to happen to the people that are in captivity, they'll come back. But here he gets right on, on the, to the bad figs. I'll pursue them with a sword, verse 18, and so forth. And, uh, but because they have not hearkened to my words, saith Jehovah, the servants of the prophets rising up early and sending them. We've seen that phrase before. But ye will not hear, saith Jehovah. Hear ye therefore the word of Jehovah, all ye that captivity, whom I sent uh, away from Jerusalem and Babylon, because you are the good figs. Notice where he's, he's writing to the people already in captivity. But he wants to talk about the bad figs. These are people in Jerusalem. And you're not going to come back from Babylon in two years like your false prophets are telling you. But you're the good fix because I'm going to bring you back. God fulfills his promise. And so I want to know exactly what God was calling good. And I say, well, good, bad, it's sinful, and, and those are not sinful. 
and we'll move on. They, they won't get it. They won't get it. He's already laid down what it meant, and we're picking up, he's blessing one and he's cursing the other, and he curses the other one, and you are very bad figs. With that thought in mind, we, we notice in, in verse 19, without not hearken unto him, and therefore all ye of the captivity have sent unto Jerusalem and Babylon, hear ye therefore the word, because I'm, I'm going to bring you back. So we're, now we're, we're getting to question number, uh, first of all, any comments about the bad figs, very bad figs and good figs, and how Jeremiah kind of repeats things sometimes. And he didn't change the context any either when he used that phrase. So we come around, very bad figs. You know, Isaiah's things about turning upside down. Very bad pigs, or, uh, bad, bad figs are those that cannot be eaten because you're so sinful and you've done so many thing, bad things. Well, all of them had sinned and gone into, even the ones going into captivity. But the good is that I'm going to remember you for good and Jerusalem, you will be destroyed. That's what they're denying. Yeah, we're going into captivity. We've got a couple of years. Jekyll and I is coming back. And the point is, you know, you're going to meet the destruction that I've set forth. And when the people see Jerusalem destroyed and they cry out to me, I will hear them. But at the sev it's 70 years and I'll come back. All, the, all that's working together, how God works things out. So what did Jeremiah say would happen now to Ahab and Zedekiah? Our question number 20. This is a different Zedekiah than the prophet who wrote the book. We're, we're being introduced to a totally different fellow. His name, his name is Zedekiah. And Ahab, that's not King Ahab. That's who, those are the men we usually think about. But because we're studying Jeremiah, we begin to learn that, no, these, uh, th these characters are interesting too, uh, and, not, and not in a, a good way. So what do you say would happen to them? Well, let's, let's, let's say they will be a curse. Let's just start where God does. Yes, you're right. But how they died will be remembered. They didn't just die. They died very violently. But the point is, they will be remembered as a curse because of what, what, what you're actually saying about he, he put, they were put to death. Nebuchadnezzar put them to death. Pick up verse 21. Thus said Jehovah of hosts, the God of Israel, concerning Ahab, the son of Koliah, and concerning Zedekiah, the son of Maaseah, who, who prophesy a lie unto you in my name. So we're, we're prophesying in the name of the Lord. And they're presenting false, false uh, prophecy. Behold, I will deliver them in the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and he shall slay them. And he says, and he shall slay them before your eyes. And there's a sense of what will, what will happen to them. And of them shall be taken up a curse by all the captives of Judah that are in Babylon, saying, uh, saying Jehovah make thee like Zedekiah and like Ahab, whom the king of Babylon roasted in the fire. That's what's going to happen to them. That's how they be remembered. A very violent death. According to the old laws that we find in the, the Babylonian laws, that was, a, that was a mode of putting people to death. And you see that part of the country, they, they burn people alive, don't they? We've seen that in our time. And that's how they were they're put to death. But that's what would happen to these false prophets that would prophesy in God's name and they are lies. God will make sure they are remembered for that, what they did. But the fact of what, what the death will stand out too. And he wants them to, to note this. Because they brought folly in Israel. They committed adultery with their neighbor's wives. They have spoken words in my name falsely. And he that knoweth and I am witness saith Jehovah. I know what they've done. He sees it all. And they're right, working follies that people are believing a lie. There may have been idolatry involved, I don't know, but the idea of believing a lie is not a good thing. And we'll see it emphasized uh, in this chapter as well, again. But the point is, is that this is what is going to be brought upon them. And when you don't care how you teach God's word, 
Might you not care about how you live your life? He's getting them for false prophecy. What else, what else are they doing? You, you, you commit adultery. You, you're, the sexual uh, activities are not, your neighbor's wives, and you've wrought folly, and you don't care that you're telling them a lie. You've made this up, and you, you're willing to put people's you know, future on the, on the line that way. You know, when, when, when people don't, when they people don't start teaching false doctrine, there's probably a lot of other things going on in their lives too that they're not careful about. And that's why I don't know what's happening in your bedroom. I don't know what's happening in your secret life or that, but when something's being taught wrong, we want to correct that. And if people say, they, they act like they don't care about what the teaching is, that's a red flag. And that's not judging motives. That's just experiencing the wisdom of God. That this is how God is saying, I saw this, I know this. And this all comes together. So why would you care about how you live your life, a holy life, when you don't care about his holy word? And the fact is, you're, you're saying things that God never revealed to you, and you know it, and God knows it. And that's why false teaching is dealt with the way it is, but it also shows a, a, a character issue that you might want to pay attention to. Uh, when people say, oh, that's just a different doctrine than we're learning. Is it right or wrong? Is it, is it dealing with things that are consequential in our life as a Christian, or is it not? You know, you'll, we'll, we'll make those decisions and determinations, but we need to make them, and I, I hope that we'll always do that as God's people. So this Ahab, this Zedekiah, Nebuchadnezzar, before him and for the eyes of God's people, burned them alive. What do you think about the prophets now? Well, if they'd been godly people, they would be martyrs. <laughs> Stephen, being stoned to death. But these men, we said, well, God brought judgment upon them. I'm the witness. I know. I see. And this is how Nebuchadnezzar will take care of them for me. That's why sometimes Nebuchadnezzar is God's servant. And we go, well, he's not a godly man. But God's using him and so forth. So, what's 21? What did Jeremiah say what happened to, well, okay, we, we did that. What did Samaiah complain to the priest Zephaniah about? So he, we begin to see these reactions to this letter being sent to the elders among the captives, as we saw the first part of uh, chapter 29. Uh, and here is Shemaiah that he didn't like what was sent. And so he's writing back now. He's responding to uh, Jeremiah's letter that he sent. And so what did he complain to priest Zephaniah about? You got a problem over there in Jerusalem. What's his name? Why don't you take care of him? You got the power, you're the priest, you're in control. Lock him up. Well, what, what has he done? Well, he's out of his head. He's, pro he, he's making himself a prophet. Well, God took care of one who, who thought they were prophets of God too, but he, this is what he's doing. So he's sending a message back. And notice he says in verse 25, Thus speaketh Jehovah of hosts, the God of Israel, saying, Because thou hast sent letters in thy own name unto all the people that are Jerusalem, and to Zephaniah the son of Messiah, the priest, and all the priests, saying, Jehovah hath made thee a priest in the, in the stead of Jehoiada. He had already been replaced by this. Uh, Jehoiada had been replaced. That there may be officers in the house of Jehovah for every man that is mad and maketh himself a prophet that thou shouldest put him in stocks and in shackles. Lock him up. Now therefore, why hast thou not rebuked, here's our problem, Jeremiah, Abanathoth, 
who maketh himself a prophet to you, for as much as he has sent unto us in Babylon, saying the captivity is what? A long. They don't like that 70 years. Their prophets have been talking about two years the max. And build ye houses, dwell in them, plant gardens, eat the fruit of them. And we don't know how Jeremiah responded, but we know that that was what has been seen here has been read by Zephaniah. And Zephaniah the priest read this letter to the ears of Jeremiah the prophet. Then came the word of Jehovah unto Jeremiah, saying, Send to all them of the captivity, saying, Thus said Jehovah concerning Shemaiah the Nethamite. Well, he, he tells what's going to happen to this fellow. He doesn't tell how he's going to respond to the people about what they should think. And that, that's why I'm, I'm saying we don't have all the details of what uh, happened next. But Jeremiah does respond. And we don't have all the details about that. But we, we're picking up who, uh, what indeed would, would, would happen. So Shemaiah is indeed complaining about Jeremiah. We don't like the spokesman. And of course, uh, we, can, we can prophesy false doctrine with something we've made up and uh, it's, God didn't reveal. But Jeremiah, we don't like his teaching. Therefore, he's a madman. And you should, have, you sh you should do your work. Does that sound familiar of something you've already read in Jeremiah? Uh, something like locking him up and and the priest in control should be doing that? I want to take you back to Pasher in chapter 20 of Jeremiah. Now Pasher, the son of Emma the priest, who was chief officer in the house of Jehovah, heard Jeremiah prophesying these things. Then Pasher smote Jeremiah the prophet and put him in stocks that were in the upper gate of Benjamin, which was in the house of Jehovah. It came to pass on the morrow that Pasher brought forth Jeremiah out of the stocks. Then said Jeremiah unto him, Jehovah hath not called thy name Pasher, but Megor Misahabed. For thus saith Jehovah, Behold, I will make thee a terror to thyself and to all thy friends. And, they, and, they, and, and, and so forth. Of course, that Megor Misahabed means, means you have no place to go. <laughs> because he's trying, you're, you're not going to escape. And of course, Pasher, verse six, 6, and all that dwell in the house will go into captivity, and thou shalt come to Babylon, and there thou shalt die. By the time that Jeremiah is dealing with this, Pasher's dead. He, he, he's not in, he, he did go back to captivity, but apparently he's not in power. He's been, he's been taken into captivity, but he's not going to be good fig. He's not going to be coming back. He's going to die there. So here is Zephaniah coming along the scene, and Zedekiah used him. He was in charge of how the temple is run. He's a priest, and how the temple is run. How does Zedekiah use him? I hope you, you're interested enough and curious enough to examine where does he come out in Jeremiah again? Or does Jeremiah say anything more about him? Well, he, well, he does. Uh, Chapter 21, we've already read. This is, not, this is not a new name. But we read in verse, chapter 21 and verse 1, the word came unto Jeremiah and to Jehovah, King Zedekiah sent him Pasher, the son of Micaiah, and Zephaniah, the son of Maaseah. That's a man. That's why I pulled up Pasher. He, he was involved in locking him up. Uh, these, these are things that are, are, are related in the, in the business that the priest ought to be in, involved with. But I want you to go pray. Nebuchadnezzar is warned against us, and we want, to, we want you to speak to God. And, and, uh, and then said Jeremiah unto them, they, uh, that thus shall you say to Zedekiah in, re, in replying. But he, he wants him to go to Jeremiah. He wants, wants the the priest to go and, and, and ask. We need God's guidance on this. Uh, what, what, what is going to happen? 
chapter 37. That's not the end of chapter 37. In verse 3, we've got another prayer request. Zedekiah, the son of Josiah, reigned as king instead of Coniah. And so forth. In verse 2, but neither he nor his servants nor the people of the land did hearken to the words of Jehovah. They spake by Jeremiah the, the prophet. And Zedekiah the king sent Jehuchal, the son of Shalemiah, and Zephaniah, the son of Maaseiah, the priest, to the prophet Jeremiah, saying, Pray now, Jehovah our God. Now he's got Pharaoh and Necro to deal with. Egypt. Chapter 52, 24, speaks about the fact that he indeed was a, a second priest. The captain of the guard took Sarai, the chief priest, and Zephaniah, the second priest, and the three keepers of the threshold out of the city. He took an officer that was over the men of war, seven men of them, and saw the king's face. And they were found in the city, and the scribe of the captain of the host who mustered the people of the land, threescore men of the people of the land, and were found in the midst of the city. And Eber, uh, Nebuzaradan, the captain of the guard, took them and brought them to the king of Babylon, to Riblah. The king of Babylon smote them and put them to death. Zephaniah, the second priest, in charge of locking up Jeremiah. What happens to him? Nebuchadnezzar puts him to death just, just like Ahab and Zedekiah, they're, they're, they're burnt by Nebuchadnezzar. Riblash is a place where he, he uh, executes a lot of the leaders of, of, of God's people. But he, he is an interesting figure. He, he meets his demise. But he's been, he's been told, you need to be locking him up. We, you know, Joida, you, you, you've taken his place. And Pastor did his job. And we find those events. That's what Jeremiah says about him. Any, any comments about uh, that, about who he was and what uh, Shemaiah co complained about? So, question 22. Did God adopt the policy of letting Shemaiah and his error alone? Just let it go? He, he wanted a request. And... Uh, I don't read where Jeremiah is put into prison after this, where he's locked up. So apparently that didn't go over too well with Zephaniah and so forth. But what, so he just let it go. You know, he taught error. He's a false prophet. This, no, no consequence, let it go. Did God let it go? No, that's why we learn things about God. He, what we do have recorded by Jeremiah it's not how he responded. Well, I'm going to be put in prison with all this. It's going, what happens is going to be the man who taught the error. That's who is going to be dealt with. And we see that in these latter verses of chapter 29. Then came the word of Jeremiah, verse 30, saying, Send to all men of the captivity, saying, Thus said Jehovah concerning Shemaiah, the Neolamite, because that Shemaiah hath prophesied unto you, and I sent him not. He hath caused you to trust in a lie. That's a big deal. When people's faith is put on a lie. And therefore thus said Jehovah, behold, I will punish Shemaiah, the Neolamite, and his seed. He shall not have a man to dwell among this people. Neither shall he behold the good that I will do to my people. Good fig, good figs. They're coming back from captivity. Who's not coming with them? Shemaiah, because he has spoken rebellion against Jehovah. Oh, maybe a little false teaching there, but it's you no know, big deal. When people denied the resurrection, Bahamanias and Philetus. I didn't say that right. I did it on purpose because they didn't deny the resurrection. They said it's already passed. And what does that do to people when the resurrection is already passed? He tells us in 2 Timothy. 
when that happens, you take away people's hope, don't you? You missed it. You missed the glories of the Lord's coming. You missed it. And it overthrows the faith of some. Not everybody. Of just some. That just rings in my, my brain all the time. And they say, well, uh, well, should I be that concerned? That's, that's not teaching correctly. That's not that's contradicting God's word here. They didn't deny resurrection. They said it's already passed. God by inspiration, calls their names. I live in a time when preachers don't think you ought to call names. Very few think, do it. But my question, why are their names called in the first place when a lot of times they don't call their names? Why are these called? Why is, what is diatrophies called? David? Warn people, that this is the man that's teaching this, and it's because people's faith, they trust a lie, their faith is being destroyed. And that word, overthrown or uh, overthrow the faith of some, that's, thank you. That's where we get our English word, catastrophe. Is Maui a catastrophe right now? It's a mess. It's just a catastrophe. Losing some soul is a catastrophe. And they, it calls their name. In fact, it does that all the time when, when an individual is, is being, that they know about is, is causing the problem. That's uh, creating uh, people losing their faith. And, you know, I had someone say, well, most of the time they don't call names, so therefore we don't call names. Well, the question is, why would you call names? If that's true, if most of the time you don't call names, why does Paul sometimes do that? Why did John do that? Well, you never, you never say negative about someone unless you have something good to say. Find me one thing said good about Dr. Fees. I'll be waiting a long time for you. Not one thing. What good thing do you find about these two men? So what, I'm, I'm going to tell you something. He just teaches a little error, but he's such a good man. Uh, don't go there. You don't know what he's doing in his private life. You know what he's doing in his public teaching. And that type of thing, if we're not anchored there, we're, we're going to be susceptible of just allowing things to, to happen. God did not leave this man alone. And he wanted, and he wants us to know, we may not know Jeremiah and being put in his stocks and all that sort of thing. We may not know how that all worked out, but we know what God told Jeremiah to say, and that's recorded. There are so many miracles that the books could not be written to hold Jesus. That's why those eight in John are very important to study. What he does say just becomes more important for our well-being. And therefore, he did not adopt a policy of letting Shephaya as heir alone. He's telling them the truth. You're going to be in 70 years. You tell them how to react to that. And uh, he's dealing with a false teacher. David, you, you had a comment? Yeah. That doesn't mean we're rude <laughs> or, or unkind, but um, I want to follow the way God told the apostle to do it. So that, that concludes our, our lesson seven. So let, let's go into, I know our time is short, but let's go into ch chapter 30. At least lay down the, the groundwork of, uh, of, of what we're looking at. So we've got four chapters here, chapter 30, 31. And 30, 30, 31, and uh, 30, 32, and 33. And this is titled in my outline, Consolation. Meaning, God is consoling his people that are, we know the good, the bad figs, the good. And people are going to come back from captivity. And there's, there's going to be a restoring. And he speaks about that. Without talking about there won't be any destruction. There's going to be destruction. We see in this first chapter, uh, chapter 30, we see that taking place. And one, uh, one thing I want you to think about. And here's again, 
why I pray, I want to get exactly what God had in his mind, not the way I may look at things in another, uh, another context. You'll notice in here in Jeremiah, I, I will turn again the captivity of my people. Who's his people? Israel. Now we've been studying the Kings and Chronicles. Israel and Judah, how do we look at that? The northern kingdom of Israel. And we look at the southern kingdom of Judah. And the question is, could he be talking about Israel when we're a hundred years down the road from 721 B.C. until the time when Josiah is, is uh, okay, when Josiah begins his work? I want you to study that. And I, I, I'd like you to, to study the kings uh, and, and chronicles about Josiah. So 721, 722 B.C., the, the captivity of the northern kingdom takes place. And here we're looking at, if Jeremiah started speaking in the early part of Josiah's uh, reign, uh, then they'd still be 100 years apart. So are we going to go with a route that Israel is just another way of saying the same thing as Judah? You may want to go there. But what would it be like if you saw Josiah, when he did his rehabilitation, and trying to get the people to, to, to turn back to God, that he cleansed Samaria, he cleansed the northern kingdom of Israel by putting people to death who were Jews. And you might as well, while, yes, captivity had happened in Israel, captivity has happened in Judah, and he may be talking about, I'm bringing all the people that have suffered the captivity, but not everybody left the northern kingdom. There's no lost tribe of Israel. So false teachers can come along. Well, we're the lost, we're the, we're the, we're the, we're the tribe to be found. There are no lost tribes. You got Asher there in the New Testament. And that's something we don't normally think about. But please consider that, that he's still talking about, I'm going to, to change that where you're living. Even in the days of Josiah, there were people, Jews, in the northern kingdom. Not everybody was spread out everywhere. And there are people still staying and trying to, you know, got a lie after Nebuchadnezzar comes in. And they were scattered. The idea of coming back into that land, uh, even after they'd gone into captivity, sometimes they say, well, that's the end of Israel, that's the end of the 12 tribes. Jeremiah said, think again, bro, think again. And I want us to think about that. And realize that maybe he's speaking about that as he brings all Israel back together because he's going to bring it back to Jerusalem and uh, the southern kingdom. And see if you can open your mind up for, for that at the same time, not contradict something else that we have. And uh, understand the word of God as it is written. Okay, well, our time is, our time is up. Thank you for being here and your contribution.